that we developed locally and then uh, deployed out to Heroku. So the first thing I want to talk about is more of the debugging mindset. Um, and this comes from the programmatic uh, programmer. And if you haven't read the programmatic programmer, I highly recommend it. It's just filled with all kinds of great little tips and tricks for you know, what it really means to kind of like work with uh, and develop software. And so one of the key things that they kind of want to point out is that debugging is really just problem solving. I mean, you have a problem that the code is presenting to you, and really the idea is to get down and figure out why it's doing what something that you don't expect it to do. And as a result, then, you know, you really want to focus on fixing the problem, not the blame. And that's kind of important just because as much as we all would love to think that we write perfect code all the time, <laughs> it's, it doesn't happen. And so, you know, sometimes it's going to be a bug in code that you wrote. Sometimes it's going to be a bug in code somebody else wrote. And so, you know, it's really important that when you're debugging to focus on fixing the problem, then you can take a step back and you know potentially do like you know the five whys or something like that to see if there's like an underlying process that potentially led to this particular bug uh, ending up in the code. The other uh, key point that programmatic programmer makes is uh, don't assume it, prove it. And what they mean by that is you know simple things like of course the variable is set to this value at this point in the code. Well. Maybe it isn't, and when you have parts of your code where there are certain things that you expect to be the case, when you're debugging, the first thing to do is really to focus on, okay, are the expectations that I have in this particular section actually true? And so, you know, I can't tell you the number of times that it's just like, oh yeah, of course that director is supposed to be there, or something like that happens, and then when you actually get into debugging the problem, it's not the case. So. When you start to debug, focus first on what your assumptions are and make sure that those are valid. And then lastly, uh, they point to the case of like uh, the example that uh, there was this one uh, developer who could have sworn up and down that the select statement in the C compiler was broken. And it wasn't until you know he went back and read the manual that he realized that he was using it wrong. And while Node is more of a bleeding edge type of system, most of the time, the node core works as expected, and a lot of the uh, other code in the system works as expected. So, tend to think that the problem is probably in code that you wrote versus a lot of the other code that you use. Uh, again, with node kind of being a little bit more cutting edge, that's not always the case, but it, it's, it's good to kind of think about that in the first place. Do you guys ever had any problems like, in the actual node core? Not that I recall. So the, the next uh, technique of debugging that um, we always, and I've always found uh, very helpful is what's known as rubber ducks, or rubber duck uh, debugging. It's this funny uh, idea that when you try and explain the problem that you're having to somebody else, you usually have this insight, oh yeah, of course, that's what it is. And so uh, this stems from the concept of, you know, if you're developing alone and you don't have somebody else there to um, kind of like have an interactive debugging session with, you know, you could just talk to a rubber duck to get it done. Which kind of also goes back to like going back to the assumptions that you have and really focus on the problem that you're trying to solve. And so I can't tell you the number of times it's just like I've walked over to somebody's desk and started explaining what was going on. And halfway through explaining, you kind of get that aha moment, go back, and you solve the problem. But so once you're in the right debugging mindset, what are some of the tools that you have available to you to actually start debugging uh, your node code? And one of the easiest, uh, most primitive version is uh, just adding console statements to your code. And Node provides a nice suite of uh, console statements that you can use. Uh, log info and log warn are data that will be sent to the uh, standard out of your process. Uh, console error and console warn will be sent to standard error. They also provide console.dir for kind of uh, dumping uh, a 
deep representation of an object. Console.trace will give you a stack trace along with a message uh, at the point that you call it. And you can use console.assert to make assertions about your code that if they prove to be false, will uh, print out the error message and give you a stack trace of when they happen. And because I've gone on talking quite a bit here, I actually want to show some code. So this is um, just a very brief uh, uh, example. And is that large enough for everyone to be able to see? So this is just a, a kind of brief run through of how all of those different uh, statements uh, can be used uh, in the system. Uh, so here we have uh, the various forms of console.log. You can pass it just a straight up uh, text message, uh, string, or object. If you don't provide any type of formatting uh, parameters, uh, the first string in a console.log statement uh, recognizes uh, a subset of printf, and it will uh, use percent %d, percent %s, and percent %j to dump out a number, the string representation of the object, or the JSON representation of the object. If you don't specify those parameters and just pass additional parameters to console.log, it will um, spit them out but use uh, nodes util.inspect to uh, dump the object. And when I run the code, you can see the difference in behavior there. Console.error is the same thing that we saw before, but just sending that output to standard error. Console.dir, as I mentioned, uh, dumps uh, the object uh, out. The trace gives you the stack trace in line. And then console.assert allows you to make those assertions. And in this case, uh, because this second uh, console.assert will fail, uh, the program terminates at that point, um, unless you have an uncaught exception handler or something like that. So this last statement is never run. Um, so if I pop over to the code um, and run that. So here uh, we can see uh, just the messages that were sent to a standard out. So the raw string. Uh, we can see this is the uh, default uh, util.inspect format for a deeply nested object. And in that second syntax, we can see that the printf formatting uh, used the string representation of the object and then also uh, printed out the representation in uh, JSON format. Similarly, the console.dir um, is equivalent to util.inspect, but just for a single object, so it's kind of handy to uh, see that output. Uh, if I switch over to uh, the other um, console.error, you can see it does the same format, but in this case it's sending it to standard error. The trace is handy um, if you have a need for it where it will print out whatever label you have and then gives you the full uh, stack trace of how the code got to uh, where you are. So that's handy sometimes for debugging to figure out what's going on. And then lastly, we see that the first assert statement is not shown at all. And the second one throws the assertion error with the message along with uh, providing the full stack trace. Uh, any questions on that before I move on? So the one thing that you can, the one thing that I find anyway is that, hey, that console statement that I put in there was pretty handy. I might want that again in the future, but who wants to have their code completely littered with all of this extraneous output that you don't always need? So the one thing that you'll find is that there are a lot of people that have put together various uh, types of uh, logging infrastructure that you can use to control how verbose the output of your program is uh, through various means. And so uh, three of the systems that uh, I see mentioned quite frequently are the debug module, uh, Winston, and Node uh, Bunyan. Um, in particular, um, I'll call out debug because uh, for anyone that is using Express, 
Uh, express by uh, express and default, uh, sorry, express and connect uh, by default use the uh, debug module. And so, if you want a little more insight into what uh, Express or Connect are doing, uh, you can uh, use that. And because uh, those are pretty popular modules, I thought I'd give you a brief um, example of how we use uh, Debug. So I've got this little program here that has a couple of workers that do stuff in the background. So if I spin that up in normal quote-unquote production mode, you see no output because the workers are happily running in the background and doing their thing. Uh, but here what I've done is I've required the debug module and then passed in a unique identifier. And so what I can do now is by setting the environment variable debug equals to some string, I can uh, change the verbosity of the debug statements that I get. So if I rerun that here with debug equals star, you can see the worker A, worker B, and controller now start spinning out uh, information along with uh, timestamps of deltas of the last time that they logged information so that you can see like how, uh, how much the uh, program uh, is doing and when. Additionally, uh, debug supports the ability to kind of like do wildcard. So in this case, uh, I have three different debuggers registered, controller, worker A, and worker B. If I want to, um, uh, here you can see I've got a couple of controller statements uh, mixed in. If I want to, I can just tell debug, only print out the statements from the workers. So by dividing up your modules and having different debug points registered, uh, you can kind of filter the output that you're seeing. Um, and then the other thing is, uh, if you are redirecting your output to another uh, system, uh, so, and by default, uh, debug uh, outputs everything on standard error, um, it will switch from the delta timestamps to like a full UTC date string. So in this case, I'm uh, kind of like redirecting my standard error uh, to a file, and so in this case, I'm now getting the full date time string for this so that uh, if you wanted to in production, uh, you could uh, easily kind of like capture the timestamp of when any of your logging statements happen. And uh, to kind of just give a brief uh, example of how Connect and Express get used, uh, in this other project, uh, you can see as the application starts up, uh, Connect Dispatcher. Uh, and the Express Router register uh, the various things, which is kind of handy to see as you're uh, looking at the routes and everything that you have defined. Like, why is, um, why when I'm at a particular point in the flow do I not have my cookies? Oh, that's because the particular endpoint is registered before the cookie parser gets passed. And so uh, I've definitely found this handy when I'm uh, mishmashing uh, a lot of different uh, middleware together in uh, a Connect Express type of application. The uh, other projects, uh, Winston and Node Bunyan, um, also have various levels of ability to control the uh, verbosity of logging that you record, uh, where it gets sent, and how it gets represented. Um, we, for a short time, used uh, Winston, uh, but ended up kind of rolling our own to give us a little bit more flexibility than Winston had at the time. I'm um, just kind of curious, um, beyond uh, these, are there any other logging systems that people are using now that they're finding particularly helpful? Okay. <laughs> uh, so, I um, definitely recommend checking these all out. They, oh, yes. Logly is the one in the Oh, Logly, okay. They use paper trail also, which is very similar to Logly. Okay. It's all plugins that you can like, it's out on something on Logly. Yeah, does that mean that you're just using console log? Um, in that scenario, you can do, most time it's just console log messages that are going out there, but obviously capture any errors and things like that. Right. I'm not using it to the, the area that I can use the console statement. Okay. I use it more for like record stuff. Like, So uh, log and paper trail are another couple options, but uh, if you're looking to kind of like have information in your 
system beyond like a uh, debugging session, uh, definitely check out one of these modules. They're all they're all really good. So uh, sometimes logging isn't enough, and that's when you really want to kind of get into an interactive uh, debugging session on uh, your local machine. And so Node has um, a uh, built-in uh, debugger that you can use. So for any program, uh, you can just type Node debug and then the program name, and you get into a GDB-like uh, debugging uh, session, uh, which is pretty raw, uh, but uh, I mean, if you don't have uh, access to some of the other uh, options, it's uh, uh, a, good, a good thing. And so what this is allowing you to do is uh, to just kind of like step through uh, your program uh, one line at a time uh, like you would with um, a normal uh, debugger to like see, like in this case, I'm about to execute the var HTTP line so I can go to the next statement, and I'm going to execute my var counts uh, line. You can also get um, a trace of where you are, set breakpoints, etc. Uh, I must admit that I've never had to use this because I find some of the other options uh, handy, but some people really like uh, this kind of really quick interface, so I feel compelled to mention it. The debugging tool I most use uh, is one called uh, Node Inspector. And what this does is this uh, exposes the uh, V8 debugging information uh, as a uh, website that you can then connect to and use the uh, built-in tools uh, in Chrome to actually debug the program. Uh, so in this case, uh, what we can do is uh, we can uh, start up uh, that same uh, program. And so you can see here the butter is listening on port uh, 5858. So in another terminal, um, I can uh, launch Node Inspector. And here you can see that it's now on a particular port uh, on my local machine and listening to that uh, debugging session. So if I go over to uh, Chrome um, and open up a new tab here, uh, I can connect to uh, that port, and I'm now in a uh, full debugging session for that, which lets me, uh, I apologize that I can't make this bigger. That's the one uh, disadvantage. Um, actually, sorry, I can't. It's just not that great. Uh, you can see, uh, you can set up watch expressions, see the call stack, uh, C scope variables, breakpoints, etc. So what I can do here is, for instance, I can set a breakpoint on this line, um, and if I then, um, from the command line, uh, issue uh, a request. Um, back over here, we can see that my breakpoint has been triggered. We can see the call stack of how the system got to that point. We can inspect the variables that are in scope here, such as the request and the response object. We can also walk up the chain to see, for instance, the closure that uh, this function is running in, uh, along with uh, all of the global state information that uh, is available. And then you can do the standard uh, step over, step into, step out uh, in here. One of the other uh, nice things that is a little crazy that uh, you can do is if you want to, uh, you can also, uh, within the debugger, modify code on the fly if you have a particular path that you want to test. So for instance, here on this first reply, I just sent back hello request one. Uh, say that is really uh, like, oh, that's supposed to be a lowercase r. I can go in here, uh, make that change, and so now uh, when the code gets returned, it's getting returned with a lowercase r um, as to represent the fact that I have made that code change. That doesn't get reflected back in your original source file, so if you stop and restart, uh, you're going to lose those code changes, but it's a really nice way to uh, interactively debug uh, an application as you're going. If you're like, oh, what happens if I make this little quick 
change, you don't necessarily lose the state of everything else that you have at the point where you want to change a little code. When you have a fairly complex application, uh, it can get a little tricky to kind of like step to the point uh, that you want. Or if you have an application that runs very quickly, uh, you might uh, want to be able to uh, plug into debugging the application from the get-go. So the other uh, option you have for launching an application besides debug is debug-brk. And what that will do is that will pause your code on the first line so that before you do anything else, um, it will pause the code. So at this point, I'm on the first line of my uh, code, and so I can set breakpoints and do any other kind of manipulation that I need to before uh, any of the code within the system is, uh, is run. There is a little of the node uh, lower level stuff that does kick in beforehand, but at this point you can basically set anything you want within your system. If after a few go-arounds you finally figure out that, okay, there's this particular point in the system that I really need to uh, focus on, uh, what you can do is uh, you can use uh, the debugger keyword. And so uh, without having to set uh, explicit breakpoints or uh, within, uh, within the code, if I go back here, I can see that it's set up. I've not actually set up any breakpoints within the code, but now if I issue a request, that debugger statement, because I started up the process in debug mode, is going to uh, break on that line. So if you kind of like find out where in the code you need to focus on, you can throw in a debugger statement, and then it will automatically kick it um, out to that point when you need it. Does this work with uh, Firefox and Fire Mode also? I don't know. <laughs> I, uh, I've primarily used it with Google Chrome. Um, it's possible it might work with other uh, other things. Uh, so, oh, uh, the one other thing that I wanted to mention is that uh, if you have a long-running node process and you then realize that it's gotten into some state and you didn't actually start it up with uh, the debug flag. Uh, you still have options. So uh, in this case, if I start up that node process, uh, I can find it. See, this is that node process. In this case, it's 625. I can send a kill USR1 to it, at which point it's now dropped into debugging mode. So for a long running process, uh, you can kick it into debug mode. I personally don't have a good sense of uh, any of the associated overhead with being in debug mode versus running normally, so I don't know if this is something that you would normally want to do, but if you have a process that got started and then you later need to debug it, you don't have to kill it before you can uh, kick it into debug mode. Yes, sorry. Um, do you know that if this node inspector is supported in node 0 0.10? Uh, yes, it, it, it is. Because the last I checked probably three or four weeks ago, node inspector is looking for maintainers. It is no longer being maintained. Oh, OK. Sorry. Yeah, so yeah, thank you. Um, that, that was the one part here I forgot to call out. Um, the newer versions of Node Inspector, if you just do an NPM install Node Inspector, I've found extremely buggy. Um, so at this point, I would recommend installing uh, 0.1.10, uh, which seems to be much more stable. Uh, after, uh, later on, uh, we can do a double check, but as far as I know, 0 0.10 also works for debugging. Yeah, I, I actually had to use the the native node debugger because I was having problems and it may be because a bunch of packages that I was or modules that I was using broke with the upgrade to 0 
I mean, they've subsequently come back online, but. Mm, okay. No, I mean, uh, uh, for the few 0 0.10 packet projects I've worked on, I, I don't remember having any problems. Okay. So, uh, you found, oh, sorry, another question. Um, one other debugging option is um, uh, WebStorm by JetBrains. Value of uh, 
a particular uh, property is this, um, along with uh, other general uh, information. And the Spatsky server collects that, and then usually uh, you feed that into a system like Graphite so that you can then get uh, historical information about uh, how your system is uh, processing. Uh, another neat option uh, is because Node is built on V8, V8 itself has a bunch of uh, uh, profiling tools built into it. Uh, and so by passing in a dash dash prof command line to a Node program, you can get a raw V8 log of what was V8 doing when. Um, and so if we go back to that same uh, example here, uh, I can rerun it uh, with node dash dash prof. It will do its thing, and in the background, it's creating that v8.log file. And the problem is, is that these v8.log files are rather verbose. So in that short amount of time, I was generating a mega data, and the uh, information in it is a little hard to decipher. Uh, so there's um, a really nice module out there called node tick that you can pass in a uh, V8 log file and see uh, what uh, the data is telling you. So uh, by default, it uh, looks for uh, the V8 log file in the current directory. And so it's now processed that and kind of given me more of a, oh, OK, what was my code doing? And so we can see here that 46% uh, of the time was in this uh, lib system C. And 25% uh, of the time was in bin node. And as we kind of go down, we can see, oh, OK, 35% of the non-lib time was on line 5 of my program. So that's probably an area that uh, I might need to dig into. We can also see that the other large time sink was the now native method of date. And if we go back and look at what this code is doing, we can see that, OK, my calling date.now is a fairly expensive operation over and over and over again. And as a result, you know, I might want to optimize this code so that's not actually uh, how you write it. But the, the point I'm trying to stress is that you can use this to kind of see where in your code you're spending a lot of time and use that to try and figure out why something is taking so long. Um, I'm just kind of curious if uh, other people have used other techniques for kind of getting a sense of how long the code's taking to run and uh, other options like that. Uh, I've used some third parties, so there's a bunch of different models. Like, so we've always used New Realm, like that we in the past. So okay. New Realm is, has a data plan for our code now that you can use. We've also been using Notify, it's a free option that's in beta. But, um, They've been less than stable. So, I'm not sure how much I'm using it. I like what they're doing a lot. And it's like great insight, great dashboard, they give you a lot of great information. It's just, um, they seem a little cavalier at the releases. Okay. Um, so, the other type of uh, profiling that you might be interested in is um, why is your process using so much memory? In the past, uh, one of the best ways to do this was with um, a, another module that worked with Node Inspector called V8 Profiler. Uh, unfortunately, uh, with uh, .8 and .10 of Node, uh, that module no longer works. And I think that kind of goes back to the comment earlier where Node Inspector and V8 Profiler kind of be a new maintainer. Uh, so uh, I've, I've never had any luck getting that uh, to work. Uh, one of the newer uh, libraries that I've run across and had some good success with is a library called Node Memwatch. And uh, I can give you a couple examples of how you can use that. Uh, so one of the first APIs uh, that uh, Memwatch provides uh, is the uh, an event emitter uh, that gives you stats and when it thinks a leak has been detected. And uh, they define a leak as memory increases over uh, five consecutive uh, garbage collection events. And so what I have down here is a very inefficient program 
that continually reads in an XML file and saves the parsed data. So uh, if I uh, run this from the command line, uh, we can see uh, that as the program continues to run, I'm getting the stats event from memwatch whenever a full GC happens. And in this case, you can see like this is the third GC, uh, which happened after 16 incremental garbage collections happened, how many times the heap had been compacted. And then the more interesting part is like, what's my minimum and maximum memory usage along with the estimated and uh, kind of current base for the process. And so here, uh, because I wasn't freeing any of the objects that I was creating, it eventually set out a uh, leak event to let me know that, okay, uh, since I started the process, uh, it's now grown uh, 67 megs, which is probably fairly indicative that uh, the uh, code I wrote is not performing very well. So uh, the idea is that you can uh, throw these uh, into uh, production code, and then as you look at your log, you can see if, like, over time if bad things are happening. And then if you do find that, okay, my code is not working as expected, uh, they provide a second API uh, called um, a heap diff. And what this lets you do is capture a start point in your code, run some code, and then see the output of what happened in the time between when you originally ran it and when you uh, stop collecting data. So if I uh, quickly run that, we can see that in the before and after points in my code, the total number of objects allocated went from 13,089 to 13,322. Um, we can see uh, the size and bytes and change uh, that it represented, but more importantly, we can also see details of what it thinks uh, happened in the system. So there were 41 new arrays created, eight closures, and uh, here's a probably good thing, uh, 101 new instances of uh, leaking class. And so with this type of information, you can kind of see if there's something glaring in your code that you know, you're not cleaning up or seems to be sticking around longer than uh, you want it to. Um, and uh, this project is uh, under a fairly active development right now, so uh, definitely something to uh, kind of keep a watch on that I think they're only kind of improve the information that uh, they're able to expose. Um, and here again, I'm just wondering if anybody else has used other things for kind of getting uh, heap or size information on a process. Okay. Uh, so, because uh, Node is uh, new and uh, you have lots of choice in what modules you can use, uh, sometimes, uh, despite what I had said earlier about, you know, maybe the system isn't at fault, isn't at fault it, it can be. Um, so uh, three of the things that I find particularly handy to kind of help sanity check and debug modules uh, are, first off, if you ever change what version of Node.js you're using, uh, you always want to do an NPM rebuild on any of your projects, uh, particularly if you have uh, native extensions that the modules compile. If anything with the, how the node uh, system uh, builds modules changes between versions, a uh, node rebuild will take care of that for you so that you can make sure that the binaries are compatible with the version of node that you're running. Uh, the second thing is a combination of npm outdated, npm ls, and npm update. These are particularly handy if you're working uh, with multiple developers on the same uh, project that might be changing versions of packages uh, or if you use um, a semantic versioning of what packages you have, um, you might find that things are getting uh, out of date. And so uh, as a quick example, um, if I run uh, npm uh, outdated here, it's pulling information uh, from the npm registry uh, about the packages that are defined and then it's saying, oh, hey, I currently have version 
0.070 in my node modules directory, but my package config says that I should be running 071. And so in this case, maybe the issues that I'm seeing are related to the fact that I should be running a newer version of the bug, but locally on my install, I still have an older version of it. Uh, NPM LS uh, gives you pretty much some of the same information, but also gives you a dump of all of the versions and subversions of packages that you have. So for instance, like I can see that uh, XML2JS has a dependency on SACS, and so this is a quick way, and in this case I can see that, okay, the version of debug that I have here is, again, uh, not, the correct, uh, not the correct version. Uh, and the last one then is um, uh, NPM uh, update, um, and uh, what this will do is um, uh, let me know that, again, debug 071 is really the version that um, I should be running. Um, so uh, in this case, uh, NPM update updated my local module to uh, the correct version. So now uh, NPM LS is uh, working fine. So this works on the uh, checking that what you are running in node modules matches what you have in package.json. The other thing that you might find is that you're running into a bug and you don't necessarily know if there's a newer version of a module that you're using. Uh, there's a package out there called uh, uh, Police, uh, which really kind of uh, is a good way to handle that for you. You can point it at uh, git repos, git users, or it also has a handy local mode. So in this case, I'm going to try and police my local package.json. And so what this is going to do is check the version that I have specified in my package.json against what's available in the uh, NPM registry. So in this case, it's letting me know, oh, hey, there's a newer version of debug out there. And if I wanted to, I could go and grab it. Um, it also has additional um, debugging help that says, oh, hey, these are all of the fields in my package.json that I failed to specify, and I might want to add to have a nice package before uh, like publishing it out uh, to uh, the NPM registry. So uh, between uh, the uh, built-in NPM commands and police, you can really kind of make sure that the modules you have are the right ones. Do you have a recommended strategy for use of wildcards in the package.json file? Does it just never do that? There are many schools of thought, and that really kind of comes down to, I found, with how much you want to control um, the code through your workflow. Um, and what I mean by that is uh, what you're testing on your local machine to potentially what you're running in a QA environment to what you're running in production. Uh, some people advocate checking in your node modules directory and then on the machine just doing an NPM rebuild. Uh, other people uh, like to use NPM shrink wrap to capture versions and subversions at a fixed point. Uh, other people are like, uh, will take uh, patch level updates, no problem. Uh, it's really kind of dependent on uh, how how liberal you want to be in pulling updates and potentially having them skew between various environments. So um, there are lots of other uh, options out there for uh, logging, uh, profiling, uh, time, memory, uh, and debugging. Uh, a few of these have already been mentioned. Um, one of the other uh, really neat things that Node has built in, uh, but uh, because I do most of my development uh, on a Mac and use a uh, Heroku for deploying application, haven't really been able to dig into is the dtrace support. Uh, that's some really cool stuff um, that I highly recommend uh, checking out uh, if you're running on uh, Linux or potentially using uh, uh, Joyent's OS. Uh, New Relic, uh, as was mentioned, has a uh, beta 
uh, node agent. Uh, that's a very popular way to uh, kind of check code. Node time is another third party service that can do a lot of performance uh, profiling and monitoring of your applications. Uh, and as mentioned, uh, WebStorm mm -hmm. is another IDE that has uh, built in debugging support instead of having to kind of like switch over to Chrome or what have you. So, unless there are uh, any other questions, uh, that's all I have. Does anybody have experience with Node time? Is there, as we're marching towards uh, production release, we're doing performance testing, and I've hand rolled some things which says, okay, number of requests and average response and request per second, and that's all well and good, but you start running under cluster, and it just becomes a mess. But I know no time they provide a free license for single instance, but they start charging kind of heavy for each instance. You know, um, has anybody had any experience with it? I've been using NodeFly in production and I've tried to run. I have not tried no, no no time. Fly. I've been using NodeFly in production. Okay. Um, and I've tried to run. I'm actually trying to get from the battery at NodeFly has been fantastic. They're free in beta. I hit, um, I got bit by a pretty bad issue of theirs yeah. um, yesterday, which is why yeah, I said yeah, right, right. right here. Here, like, I had specified stable, which is like for their dot, which I thought was a good thing to do because I was starting a third party system, but um, they made it so I couldn't connect my, my authoriz authorization to Redis. So um, just took a while to track down. Um, so. so, anyway, you can try it. It's great, but I don't have the best experience. I, I've used it over the last month as the first issue I've had. If yeah, it hadn't happened yesterday, I would have been like, it's fantastic, you go with it. Yeah. But, um, and then New Relic, um, when I, New Relic has like, been amazing on the Rails side when I've used it in the past. Um, I haven't dug it up into it yet. I just set it up quickly and I've been emailing with their, their developers. Like I said, I'm hoping to get new time New Relic and New Relic come here to come like, yeah. That would be nice. So, Try to tell both here yeah, well, I'm at the single instance at this point, so yeah, I'll yeah, say. yeah. Um, anyway, I'm probably going to switch over to New Relic this week, just because I'm getting off the fly for right now. Um, so I'll let you know how it goes. Okay. But they're they're paid to get like really substantial, and they're they're pretty expensive as well. Yeah, we um, we evaluated no time, but ended up uh, using uh, StatsD uh, to capture similar data. So StatsD will catch some of that stuff. Well, I mean, so. We, uh, StatsD, there's no built-in support. Uh, we had to augment our own code with uh, various handlers and stuff. Uh, but we were able to track like uh, the time that any uh, operation to Redis or Mongo took, along with uh, how long HTTP operations took, and we're able to break it down across like this particular get URL scheme took had these time performances. So, so you so you're man manually collecting the stats, but they're aggregating them and dealing so with it. So with, with the combination of uh, StatsD and Graphite handling that, uh, I believe the uh, JavaScript, uh, the other JavaScript meetup is going to be having a upcoming presentation on StatsD, uh, which we'll probably dig into with that a lot more. Got to get on those. Those guys are weightless within a day uh, or two. Okay. <laughs> Uh, any other questions or comments? Just uh, and asking about that a little further. So are you, where are you hosting your graphite server? Where is StatsD hosted for your production environment? Uh, so uh, we uh, set up a uh, virtual private server uh, that we uh, send all of the uh, StatsD information to. Oh, OK. And then also have graphite running on that same instance so that we can then uh, pull out the data. Okay. Do uh, so the decent cloud hosting uh, purpose for Nutrius? Sorry, what was that? Cloud, cloud based servers for hosting Nutrius? Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of good options. Uh, we ran our platform on Heroku, uh, which has uh, pretty good uh, support uh, and they also have uh, support for a lot of other plugins. Um, uh, Nojitsu is another uh, very common platform. And uh, I've been very impressed with uh, what uh, Windows Azure has also been doing for node hosting. I don't know if anybody's used other ones that might. I mean, the Rails one, those guys did uh, switch our engineer. Oh, engineer. 